So pandemic fatigue is driving some divorced parents to move back home to their birth country or people to move to other areas of the country, maybe where they grew up. People are starting to say, hey, I'm in an expensive area. Turns out I can work from home. I can make this work. But if they're divorced parents and there are kids involved, how does that work out? Can you just take the kids and pick up and leave? Alyssa Bach, associate lawyer with Shulman and Partners LLP, joins me now. How much of an issue is this right now, more so than in the past because of the pandemic and because more people are working from home? Yes, it's definitely something that we've seen a rise in the inquiries that we're getting with respect to relocation and the reasons for the request for relocation. And I would say that that attributes mainly to the pandemic, people working from home, people being isolated from their families, especially if their families are further away. And that's really sparking people to reassess where they're living and where they want to be living. Okay, uh, and all of that is understandable, but what are the legalities? Uh, two parents are divorced, they're both living in Toronto, and then one parent says, hey, uh, turns out I can work from home, my company is accepting of the idea of me continuing to work from home no matter where home is, and so I'm going back to uh, Wadena, Saskatchewan, and I'm going to work from there, and by the way, I'm taking the kids. Can, it's not that simple, is it? No, it's not. Mobility is probably one of the more complex areas when it comes to family law. We've also recently seen a change in the law, specifically the Divorce Act, and they made it a little bit more clear for parents when they're looking at relocation and what the courts are looking at. And so one of the biggest things is, um, and always has been, the best interest of the child, but one of the newer things that they're looking at is Uh, whether or not there's a primary parent. So are the children primarily with one parent? Is one parent primarily responsible for decisions for the child uh, versus more of a shared parenting regime? And then they've analyzed that and said, look, if you have one parent who's primarily taking care of the children, we're going to look at their reasons for moving, and the other parent now has to show why that wouldn't be in the kid's interest. And so this is something that we're seeing a shift and coupling that with the pandemic and parents wanting to relocate, this is when we're seeing more inquiries coming up and more parents wanting to make that move. How does a court determine who the primary parent is? Yeah, so most parents, um, after separation, they'll either have an agreement or they will have a a separation agreement or a court order in place that will outline if Either one parent or both parents is responsible for making decisions for the child and then outlining what the specific time with each parent is. Um, If parents don't have it in place by an agreement or order, it's either done kind of by de facto that that's what has occurred since separation or they're in the process of figuring out what that looks like. And so the court looks at those factors and says, is there an agreement in place? Is there an order in place or what has it looked like and for how long? Courts do the best they can to determine what's best for the kids. They don't know the family. Um, These are not people in the family. There's an advantage to a third-party decision-making process, but there are disadvantages to it as well. How often are decisions made by parents that are in the best interest of the children as opposed to the worst interest of the ex? No, that's, that's definitely fair, and that's something that you always want to try to start with negotiations and really putting the children first because if the two of you can't make an agreement and if you can't figure out what's going to work and you go before a judge it's going to be pretty clear that your reasons are uh, perhaps vindictive in nature as opposed to really focusing on what's best for the kids because When the two of you are sitting down, whether it's with a mediator or with your lawyer, um, and trying to work out and say, look, I want to move. These are the reasons I want to move. This is why I think it's in the kid's best interest. Here's my proposal for how we can make up kind of the parenting time, whether it's over summers or holidays, uh, to try and make sure that that relationship is still maintained versus saying, okay, I want to move. I'm going to move. I haven't really considered any of these things. I've just decided I'm going to do it. Those are two very different situations, and it becomes clear or uh, more clear why the parent is really looking to move, and that can impact whether or not it's actually in the child's best interest or something that's just um, being kind of decided without a lot of thought. 
Alyssa Bach is with me, associate lawyer with Shulman and Partners. We're talking about pandemic fatigue and some of that driving and the idea that we can work at home, driving some divorced parents to move back home to a birth country, more than just across this country. And that, of course, brings up the consideration of what happens with the children. So if the primary parent decides to move a significant distance away, Alyssa, is it then incumbent on the other parent to spend the money to go back and forth and visit their children? So this is one of the things that comes into play. So perhaps the parent who's moving to, say, the U.K., and flights are rather expensive, and you've got this arrangement that the other parent will see the children on, like, summers for extended periods, or they'll come and visit during a a holiday break from school. Now you look at, does that parent have a support obligation? Is the cost of travel excessive in a way that it would impact what their support payments are? Like, there are ways to kind of assess that extra financial burden and how that impacts um, the other kind of financial questions that are occurring for the family. How much input do the kids have uh, given that age is going to make a difference? Yeah, the older they are, the more weight their views and preferences are going to be given. Um, And so you can see that um, like you could have a very young but mature child, and when I say young, I mean perhaps 12 versus a 16-year-old who perhaps doesn't have the same maturity. Um, and so this is where it's not necessarily just age, but a lot of other factors as far as um, their awareness and their consistency with their views. But the older they are, the more their views and preferences are going to come into play. So if you have a child who's saying, look, I want to stay because of all of these reasons, or I want to go because of all of these reasons, and that they're showing kind of thought and um, assessment of why they want to go or don't want to go, then that's definitely going to be factored in. Well, oftentimes it's because their friends are here. Yeah, and their ties to a community are something that will be taken into consideration. If you've got um, a child who's older, who's in school, perhaps they're in their final year of um, high school or they're kind of going into that um, only a couple of years left and that they have a strong preference to finish out in the same place that they've been and that's an option that's available, um, then that's something that would be taken into the consideration. We hear stories all the time about how this or that is unfair to women. But in this particular case, Alyssa, I don't know how you'll react to it. Uh, a lot of men feel that the whole family court thing, the whole, all of these processes are weighted way heavily in favor of mom and not dad. No, I think that where that stems from is where kind of historically like what they have looked like. And the courts are, at least in my view, they've come a long way in recognizing that mom is not necessarily always the primary parent and that the law is drafted in a very neutral way and that when they're assessing it, they're looking at um, what are the relationships with each parent, what are their involvements, and we're seeing it um, a lot more that it's, it's not necessarily one gender or the other that is the primary care holder for the children. I only have a couple of seconds for this, but you ever sit in your office with, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, and in your mind you're thinking, oh my God, <laughs> like, <laughs> can you get over yourself and think about your kids? I, I think that it's something that uh, there's always a lot of tension, there's always a lot of emotions running very high at a time of separation, and especially if there are less than ideal reasons for the separation, that can trigger some emotions, and that's where when when somebody sits down with me, I'm new. I'm impartial in the sense, like I'm not there. To I, I know. Judge, I, but you I'm know what? I've run us out of time here, Alyssa, <laughs> and I apologize. Alyssa Bach with Shulman and Partners. Thanks very much, Partners. Thanks very much.